Hello, welcome to the video series on programming with Python and R. So in this video we're going to do something a little different where I'm not going to show you specific programming concepts so much as I'm going to give you advice on how to use code that you find online. Right, because probably you've already been googling how do I do such and such in Python, how do I do this in R, did someone already write this um, into something that I can use. So the learning objectives here are one, showing you some common places where you can find code that you can reuse online, um, and also how to tell the difference between different types of code that you might want to reuse. So how to tell if something is a script or a function definition or a whole package that you can install, and how would you use each of these things. And then lastly, um, for code that you've found online, how can you judge whether or not it's something trustworthy? Is it going to do what you think it does? So some advice in general. Um, I know this is a tall order, but I would avoid blindly using code if you don't fully understand it. Um, Right, I would at least look at it and say, okay, well, if I had a few hours to spare, do I feel like I could figure this out? Does it look like something where there is a straightforward input and output? Um, right, because if you're like, well, I don't understand 90% of this, but I'm just going to put my data in and assume it's a black box and it'll do the right thing, uh, that's pretty dangerous, especially since virtually all open source code comes with no sort of warranty or guarantee attached to it. Um, I would also avoid using code that's poorly documented. Uh, my opinion is that if it's worth writing code and worth putting it online to share with people, it's worth writing up a very good document explaining exactly how people can use that code. You know, what are the inputs and outputs? What's the methodology behind it? You know, examples of how to use it. Um, and make it, make it as easy to understand as possible. Um, and if someone hasn't put in that effort, that's generally kind of a sign of laziness. And not only does it mean it's harder for you to figure out how to use the code, it means they might have been kind of lazy with the code to begin with. Um, now, uh, if you're really a novice, um, even good documentation, you might have some trouble understanding some things, but I'm going to try to help you get through a few of those hurdles uh, in this video. Um, and I would also, um, anything you use, especially if it's not something that's widely used, like something that's really you know published and widely cited, I would test it out with a small dummy data set to make sure it's doing what you think it's doing. So create just a miniature data set that's kind of representative of your data set um, and see if you get the output that you expect. Um, now, if you're a scientist, you might expect to use code that's associated with a peer-reviewed uh, journal article. Um, but I wouldn't... So that, that is nice because it means if you use the, the code in your own publication, you have something to cite. But it's not necessarily a guarantee that the code is robust and trustworthy. Uh, often peer reviewers don't really take the time to look through code associated with a manuscript they're, that they're reviewing, or they might not particularly be interested in software design and software robot robustness so much as they're interested in other aspects of the paper. Um, likewise, there's plenty of very good code out there that isn't associated with any peer-reviewed publication. For example, if someone makes some code for converting between file formats, um, you know, that by itself really isn't enough to, to merit um, a peer-reviewed publication in a, in a scientific journal. Um, so they may have never done that sort of publishing, but it might still be very good code. And just as a reminder, there's a table of contents in this video if you decide you want to skip ahead to a different language or a different section. So let's start off with how to get code that you can install. So this website that I'm at, PyPy, this is the Python package index. So this is uh, the biggest place to um, host Python code that you want to share with other people. You can see that there are quite a lot of uh, projects and files uh, associated with this website. Um, so say uh, I'm going to search for genomics. 
um, just because I have a genomics project and I want to, to find some Python functions to do some things with that, you might search for something a lot more specific realistically. Um, but we'll do this as an example. All right, and so I have um, a bunch of different Python packages with that um, keyword. So let me take a look at this first one here that's actually called genomics. So I have a brief description of it telling me how to install it and how to use it, uh, but not really uh, exactly what's in it and what I can use it for. But I notice here that it has a website, so I'm gonna go take a look at that. And this is actually a, a GitHub site where, uh, where the source code is hosted. Um, and I, if I look, I see that there is a file called .py. So that's going to be the actual Python file. So I can take a look at that. So if I click on that, now I see the actual code that is part of this package. Um, uh, so uh, what am I looking at exactly? Every place I see this keyword def, D-E-F, that's short for definition. So this is the definition of the function. So this is the function name and the name of two arguments that go into it. And right under the beginning of this uh, def header, I see what's called a comment string. So this is, uh, this is the documentation for the function. Uh, in, in Python, it's, it's actually in the Python file. And in, in other cases, you might find documentation elsewhere. Um, especially if it's a Python script and not a bunch of functions. And at the end of the function definition, you see this return statement. So I can say, okay, um, this function gets a bunch of kmers uh, occurring in a given string. And so I put in the string, I put in the length of the kmer that I wanted. Um, and I can see uh, sort of what it's doing. Um, so the nice thing about a function like this, it's really short. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know how published and widely used this is, but I know that, you know, I could take a little bit of time. Maybe I'd have to Google some of this stuff, but I could, I could look it up and see what's happening in this code and understand what's going on. So that makes me feel good about it and trust it. Um, I also see exactly what goes in these two arguments and what comes out, the item with the return statement. And then after the return statement, that's the end of the function definition. And so I see down here, it actually gives me some examples of usage as well. So you might be tempted to just copy and paste out of here. And I could do that. So I could copy this and go into Thani. Um, let's save this as uh, uh, genomics test.py. It doesn't really matter where you save it right now. Um, and so after that function definition, maybe I want to try using the function and so I would use it like this. I'm just going to put in a random um, DNA sequence there and then the length of the k I want. And let's print that out and see what I get as a result for it. Right, so this first one will go to the S argument, and the second uh, one will go to the K argument. So if I save that and run it, I get a printout, and it's like, okay, this is what I expected. Here's the first five letters of that string, the next five letters of that string. Um, basically, every possible uh, set of five consecutive letters have gone into this set that got output. Right. But the intention of having it in, um, in PyPy, so let's go back to the PyPy page for it, is not that you can copy and paste it, um, but that you can actually install it. And actually, it gives you the instructions for that right here in case you're not super experienced. So in Windows, I'm going to open up my command prompt. 
Right, and so if I go pip install genomics, um, it looks like all of that worked. I get a little warning that I should upgrade pip, but um, it does say I successfully installed genomics 0 0.1. So then what I can do is I can say, I could do two, two ways to use that. I could say import genomics, and then I could say, call this genomics dot get kmers to call this function. Or if I'm going to be using this function a lot, uh, I can do it the, the other way. So I can say from genomics import get kmers, and then I don't need to specify where that, um, what module that function came from. So let's save that. We'll run it again, and it seems to have worked again. Um, you'll see it's a little bit different. They're, they're printed in a different order, but that's just a function of this being a, a set. Um, sets in Python just get printed in a random order. And so one last thing to uh, remind you about with PyPy is uh, there's no guarantee that um, the science behind anything, any code that you find here is rigorous. It's just anyone can host code here as long as it's not malware or anything like that. Um, you know, so do, do be careful with what you use. Look and see if it's published, etc. Or, or like this one, just look at the code itself and say, okay, do I understand this? Does it have clear documentation? Right, because otherwise there's there's no guarantee that this code is going to do what it says it does. So the equivalent repository to find R packages is called CRAN. So if I go to rproject.org, I'll see this link to CRAN. So that's where I want to go to browse packages. And if I go here, it gives me a bunch of mirrors. Um, if you uh, Pick one near you, like I'm in the Midwest, so I often go to Iowa State, and, th and then it's just going to be a lot faster than if you pick a mirror somewhere else in the world. Um, so if I want to look at packages that are available, I click this packages link. Um, generally, I want them sorted by name. It tells me how many there are. You can see that R is not quite as big as Python because Python has a lot of uses outside of data analysis. Um, but generally, I want to look at them by name, uh, right? And it's going to give me this whole list with some links to uh, alphabet letters uh, at the beginning. Uh, so say I've heard there's an R, uh, R package for circular Manhattan plots. Uh, actually, let me look it up here. So here, okay, Google's a little bit faster than doing a find on there. So I can see that the name of the package is cmplot. So then maybe I want to browse to it. So here I'll go find cmplot. Ah, right, it's called circle Manhattan plot here. That's why I didn't find it before. All right, so if I look here, uh, it's got a description of the package. Now, usually nowadays, uh, the CRAN maintainers want you to put a link to, or a, a, a DOI link to any publications about the package in the description. Uh, so if you don't see a DOI in this description, it probably doesn't have a, a publication associated with it. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. So I can read this description to learn about what this package does. If I want to get in more detail, there are some links down here. Like for example, um, I can see there's this reference manual. So this is a really great way to browse through the package functions without having to install the package yet. So I can look at that and I get the same description of the package. I have the, the email for the author if I need to contact them. And then I have um, a description of, of what's documented in here. And so uh, 
Yeah, this is not the greatest table of contents ever because this, this, this first one makes it look like it's just about the package, but if I look, I see it's describing the function. Um, so this is the same information that would come up if I typed a question mark and then the name of the function from R if I had this installed already. Um, but from here, I can see a description of what this function does. I can see all the different function arguments. All right, I guess this one is just making a plot, so there's no um, value section describing what's returned by the function, but it does describe what each uh, argument does, um, as well as some notes about it um, and some examples of how to use it. So these other two things that are documented here, um, like this pig60k, this is a, a data set that you can practice with. Um, and that allows you to see how the data should be formatted and that sort of thing, and what, what the output might look like. Uh, so say I've decided, yeah, I want to use this. Um, it looks pretty good to me. How would I install it? So because it's on CRAN, that makes it really easy to install from R. I can go into my R console and I can type install dot packages and then in quotes I put the name of the package and that's all I have to do to install it. Here it's taking a minute, there we go. And then if I'm going to uh, use it, in fact let me make a little R script for testing it out. Now I can do library cm plot um, and I see I get this this other link. Um, usually URLs for, for a package, if it's a non-CRAN URL, are supposed to go um, on the um, you know package description page, but this one at least it, it prints out uh, when I use it. So I might save that to take a look later. And now that I have it loaded, I can, uh, again, pull up that help page. And this is exactly the same help page where we saw a PDF of it earlier. Um, and maybe I want to try that example. Uh, so I'm going to run this data function to load in the data set. And then I'll try out uh, the CM plot function. Um, and it looks like it just saved it uh, to my D drive. Um, but anyway, then I could go to this directory, uh, take a look at uh, other plot and, and see, see if I liked it, see if it was doing what I thought, maybe um, try changing some of these parameters and see if they're behaving the way I think they do. All right, so let's also take a look at this website. In fact, I think this is what's linked right here. So this is someone's GitHub page for this R package. And so they have instructions for doing what we just did for how to get it from CRAN. Um, and they have uh, some instructions for using the uh, uh, example data set, some pictures of the output. So this is a little bit nicer in this case than what I could find on the CRAN page. Now I believe, um, yeah, so it also has this optional thing that they commented out here for how to use it. Um, and that's using the source function. So in this case, this person has put a more, slightly more up-to-date version of the functions on GitHub than on CRAN. Um, and I can tell you as someone who has contributed to CRAN, it can be a little bit of a pain in the butt sometimes. So I don't, I don't really blame someone for keeping their GitHub slightly more up-to-date than the CRAN version. You know, maybe they'll make a bunch of changes and then put them all on CRAN at once. So I could try that instead. All right, so what am I doing with this source function? 
Um, I, I may have mentioned in another video, the source function will take any R script and execute anything in that R script. So in this case, it's going to this file cmplot.r, it's finding it online from this URL, and then it's going to run that. In fact, I can take this, let me copy and paste it into my browser to see what I get. What I, if I look at it, this is actually an R script, right? So this is where the function is defined. And so here uh, I could look at all the source code. Uh, I could also look at it from, um, you know, if I go to R. Here's sort of the nicely formatted version, but because this has all this other stuff that, that you know, if you're actually running it in R, it doesn't want to read all of the other code on this website. This is just the raw one that just has the R code. Um, all right, so I have all of the arguments here. And in this case, I can tell this is a function definition in R because we use a function called function to make a function. Um, basically the same way we would create a variable with this um, arrow operator, we can create a function that way. So here we have the name of the function. And then within this function, you know, statement, this function function, um, we have all of our different arguments. So that's where we see that these. And again, if I go to the very end, so this, this, in this case, this is a very long function. Um, <coughs> this is not something where you probably want to sit down and understand all of the code unless you really get stuck on something and you're worried about it. Uh, if I go to the end, yeah, this one doesn't have a return statement, but it's common. For, if, an, if an R function actually gives you something back, like gives you a value back, there is going to be a return statement at the end of it. All right, so, so this, is, this is R code defining a function. So then if I run source, it's going to take that script and run it, and then I'm going to get the function definition. So if I run that line, now I see that I have the function actually in my global environment. All right, and then I could run it from there if I wanted to. So in this case, this is how I would get the slightly more up-to-date version of this. Well, let's look at a second example of an R package. So I'm going to search for polysat, which is, is one of mine. All right, and so here, like the other one, it has a description, but here are these links that I'm talking about where I can go look at the publications if I want. Um, so if I click that DOI, I see here's the actual journal article descri describing um, this R package. All right, so these should be in here if they are. Um, and alternatively, the package maintainer may have put in a citation file um, where you can see citations uh, for any journal articles that are associated with it. Um, let's see. Uh, in this case, uh, there's a link uh, to the website right from this page. So I can, uh, I'll click that to take a look at it in a minute. And so in addition to the reference manual like we had for the other one, where it's going to describe every function. Basically, this is allowing you to look at the help pages before you install it. Here we have something called vignettes, which is more of an informal tutorial, more of a freestyle sort of thing. So the, the package maintainer um, can lead you through tutorials showing whatever they think is most important and showing how all the different functions can work together. Right, so if, it, if a package has these vignettes, I highly recommend looking at them because that's generally going to be a better tutorial than going straight to the reference manual. Right, and another thing is if I go to um, the page, in this, in this case, this is a, a wiki describing uh, the package, but I can look at the code on GitHub. Right. 
And so the other uh, package that I looked at, CMplot, uh, really on GitHub, the only thing that was hosted was the R code itself. But in this case, the whole package is here. So how can I tell that this is a complete R package and not just some R source code? So an R package is always going to have a folder called R. It's always going to have a folder called man. And it's always going to have a file called description. So if you see those three things, that probably means that the entire R package is here on GitHub. And in that case, if the GitHub version is a little bit newer than the CRAN version and you want the version on GitHub, there's a special function uh, to get that. So I'm going to use install.packages to get a package called devtools. And this is going to contain a function that I can use to install our packages directly from GitHub. So now that I have DevTools, I can use a function called install underscore GitHub to uh, install that package. And so I would just put this URL in there for the uh, package. And so if I run that, that's going to show me this is where it's getting it from, and then it's going to download that and install it. For the sake of time right now, I say I won't install anything else. So alternatively, because this is on CRAN, I can still use install.packages to get it that way. In fact, that'll be a little bit faster since here it's having to compile it from the source versus if I got it off of CRAN, it would already be compiled. But if there were new features that weren't on CRAN yet, I would want to use this one. Okay, so that's CRAN. And a lot like uh, PyPy, uh, all of the checks that happen for packages on CRAN are just automated checks. So there isn't, uh, there isn't really a human being looking at these packages to make sure that they're scientifically rigorous or anything like that. Um, so again, I would you know, be cautious, take a look at it, uh, see if there's anything published on it, see if the code is well documented and it makes sense to you um, before I would completely trust it. Uh, so there is one other fairly popular uh, repository for, for R packages, and that's called Bioconductor. So this is mostly for bioinformatics, although there are a few packages that are more broadly applicable, like there's one that I like for principal components analysis that's in here. Um, so this is a smaller number of packages, but they're more focused on bioinformatics. Um, and this one does have more rigorous review. So if a package gets submitted to Bioconductor, there actually is a human being that looks at it and makes sure it meets their scientific standards. And the other nice thing about Bioconductor is that all of the packages are sort of released together at once every six months, and they make sure that they all will function together every time they're released. So let's look at an example page for one of these. Um, so this is one of their most basic packages, uh, BioStrings. So they have um, instructions for installing it. Um, so uh, to install something from uh, Bioconductor, you want to get this uh, package called BioC Manager. Right, and that will then give you the connection directly to the Bioconductor repository for installation. So if I wanted to get that BioStrings package, 
I would use BIOC manager and then two colons and then install, kind of like I use these two columns for dev uh, tools. That's just telling it which package to get this install function from. Uh, BioStrings, that was the name of the one that I was looking at. So then this is how I would get that package. Um, now I'm doing something that's kind of a bad idea where I'm, I'm running this after I've already been running some stuff. Uh, but as a general rule, I recommend um, first open up R and then the first thing you do is run this because that will prevent some conflicts from happening. But if I run that, it's going to install that. Um, sometimes Bioconductor installations can take a few minutes, so it's going to ask me, hey, do you want to update all these other packages? Generally, it's a good idea to say, yes, I want to update all of them. That'll prevent a lot of problems for you. Right, and so now it's installing everything else that this depends on. So th this is pretty typical for Bioconductor. Um, don't be surprised if you're sitting here for a few minutes. And this may be because I already had a lot of Bioconductor packages on my computer. It wants to update them all for me. And what I should look for is... Um, some of these where it says it can't remove the prior installation, that might mean that it was installed somewhere where um, you wouldn't need administrator access or it might be a package that's already loaded. Um, right, and I like RCPP, I might not have gotten that warning if, um, if I hadn't already loaded some other things before I started. Um, but at the and it looks like I don't have anything telling me that something went wrong, so it looks like now I could load that package with the library function. So how would I learn more about the, that package? Uh, so if I um, look at this site, um, they have the documentation. So a lot like CRAN, there's a reference manual where every function has its own page describing it. And so this is the same as the help pages that you would get by typing in a question mark. Like if I typed in AA string class. Oop. I'll delete this part. And it's putting these tick marks around it for me because otherwise this minus sign would cause some problems. Um, it's going to put up this help page, which is the same as this one that I can see here on the internet. Um, <coughs> but like uh, other R packages, there are also these various vignettes. Like this one has a handy table telling me about uh, some of the different functions, kind of categorizing them for me. So that's really helpful. And then I know which ones to look at if I want more details. Right, and we have some other um, basic information. In this case, there's no URL. This kind of is the website for this, this package. So far, I've shown you several packages that are hosted on GitHub. So let's talk a little bit more about what GitHub is. It's very popular right now, um, and I've noticed a lot of biologists seem to think of it as a place where you can host your code. You can upload it, and then other people can access it from there. Um, and that's true, but it, it can do a lot more than that. And that, that really could be the subject of its own video. Um, but it's a, it's a website for hosting uh, code that you're working with using a piece of software called Git, which is something that you'd install on your local computer. Um, and what Git is really good for doing is tracking changes. Um, so like here, if I, if I click on this commit, I look at that and it lists every change that has been made here. And for example, uh, I can click on one of these and it shows me exactly what changed there. Um, 
So even if you don't end up using GitHub for your own code, although I highly recommend it, um, if you're using someone else's code and you notice, oh, they made a new version, I'm not really sure what's changed and if it's okay, you can always browse back through these commits to see that. Um, and so here I was looking at a list of all of them, uh, but if, say, I was interested in a particular uh, function or something, um, say here I can look at the history just of this file and then it will I can look at changes just happening to this file All right so the red is stuff that got deleted and then the green is stuff that got added in and if it was really sort of a change to a line it highlights it there so that's kind of nice and uh, yeah, so that's what these messages next to these folders and files mean. They're not a description of the file. They're a description of the last change that was made to it. And if there's a readme file associated with it, that's going to be what is displayed right underneath the file list right here. And I mentioned this earlier in the video, but say I was interested in this file and I wanted to either download it or um, run it, say, with source uh, in R. Uh, I wouldn't want this particular URL right here. What I would do is I would click raw, and then I get the plain text version, and then that's the version that's actually executable. A few other things you can do with GitHub. If you are pretty sure you found a bug or a problem with the software, that's what this issues tab is for. So you can create a new issue to let um, the package developer know that you found a problem, or you can browse through existing issues to see if someone else had the uh, same problem. Um, if you are pretty sure you know exactly what's wrong with the code and you could fix it yourself, that's what this pull request is for. That's basically a way to suggest a change to a piece of software. And then the person who developed the software can look at that and they can decide if they want to incorporate it, and then they can merge your changes in. Um, and you'll get credit for that, like you'll show up as a contributor to the package that way. Um, another thing that might come in handy for you as a user, if you want to make your own copy that you can just change and mess with at, uh, however much you want, that's what the fork is for. Uh, so again, I can't go into super details on all of these in this video, but they're things to look uh, into if you want to um, sort of work with your code in an, in an organized way. Um, or make changes to other people's code in an organized way. And again, keep in mind that anyone can put anything on GitHub as long as it isn't malware. Um, so anything you find here, be sure to confirm that you believe it's actually scientifically rigorous and does what you expect. Okay, now I want to take a look at what do we do if we find a Python script online? How do we use that script? How do we recognize what it is? So here's a hypothetical scenario where I have this hapmap file and say I want to be able to convert it to other formats. So this, if you're not familiar with this, this is a format for storing genetic marker data. So let's say, and I want to do it in Python, let's just say yeah, I know Python. I want to. I want to see if there's a Python way to do this. All right, and I find this Snip Tools uh, repository on GitHub. Right, and it's got a README file, so I can read a little bit more about how to use it. Um, although. Uh, if you're pretty new to learning Python, you might be confused at first about what are these things talking about, like where do I put all of this? So we're going to get into that. And you might say, okay, well, where's the Python code? Uh, it's going to be in this SRC folder that's short for source. So that's the shorthand that a lot of programmers use for the, the folder where their code goes. I'm going to look at source. Okay, and there's this convert.py. So I bet that does what I want. All right, so I can look through here. Um, and if I'm really new to programming, maybe this is a little confusing, but like we said before, when we see def, okay, that's a function definition. Um, right, but one 
important thing to notice is this that it's using this arg parse module. And what that is for is if you're not running Python in something like Thonny, but you're actually running it from your operating system shell, then you can pass arguments right to the Python script from there, and you actually never have to open the Python code and look at it. Um, so this is a good, good indication that this code is meant to be run from the command line. Right? And this is also nice where I've got nice short function definitions that even put a bunch of comment characters in between them. So if I want to try to understand what's going on, I can do that. And probably down as we get down to the bottom, um, there's going to be um, this main function, which will, probably looks like it's a little, or, you know, this main section that looks like it's a little funny, but this is what's actually going to get executed. Um, when you run the script. And if you look in here, you're going to see that it's calling these various functions that were um, up earlier in the script. Right, so let me download this so I can try it out. Uh, so I could download individual files, but right now I'm not totally sure if some of these Python files are maybe dependent on other ones. Um, Although I suppose I could I could figure that out by looking at um, this one that I want and um, yeah from snip tools import everything um, so this is at minimum going to also need this snip tools thing so that you know, you know this convert won't run without snip tools so you know what I'll just download the whole thing um, with this download button. Um, so if you don't have git installed, download zip is going to be what you want. And again, if you want to start using git, you know, go for it, but I'm, I can't teach you in this video, but the, you'll use this link um, to download it with git. So I'm going to download a zip file. All right, I'll save it in here. I'm going to unzip that. Right, and now I've got this snip tools master. Um, and so now I've got my own copy of all of those files. Now to make life easy for the time being, I'm going to take my hat map file and I'm actually going to move it into the source folder. I wouldn't want to really uh, leave it there long term, so I have to close it before I can move it. Um, but for now, it's just going to make it a little bit easier to type the command if it's in the same folder as the code. All right, if you get a little bit more proficient with the command line, you'll learn other ways to deal with this. All right, so on Windows, I'm going to open up my command prompt. Right, and I am going to uh, get myself into the folder uh, where that code is. So because I have multiple hard drives on this computer, first I have to change the hard drive like that. Um, And I'm putting, uh, so CD is change directory. This will work both on Windows and Mac and Linux. And then because I had a space in my folder name that I wanted to go to, I had to put the whole thing in quotes. Um, and I'm using backslashes because I'm on Windows. If you're on a Mac, use forward slashes. Oh, and my mistake was that I used an underscore instead of a hyphen, so let me change that. So I press the up arrow to get my command back, and then I'm going to change it. Okay, so now I'm there in Windows. I can type dear, and it shows me all of the folders and files that are there. Um, on a Mac, I would type ls. And let me change one more time into the source directory, so cd source. Now look again. Okay, and there's all my Python files. 
and my HatMap file. And so um, let me type, I want to learn more about this convert function. So I would type Python and then convert.py, which is the name of the script that I want to run. So it gives me this warning, no input file. So a lot of scripts might help. Yeah, so that one has something at least to show me if I type in help. So what did I do? I typed Python, I typed the name of the script, and then two dashes, and then the word help. And that pulls up the help page for this script. So see, I'm not even having to open it in Thani. Um, it's, it's just um, from here I can use it. Um, so it's telling me the various arguments that I would put into the script. Um, okay, it's telling me what this does. Converts between SNP file formats. Um, it gives me an example, um, some explanation, um, and as well as um, an explanation of the arguments. And now that I look at this, it's like, okay, that's that's what what was it was showing me here, um, and sort of this is this is what it was showing me here as well. Um, so now it's like, okay, I understand this a little bit better. What it's doing is. What it's showing me here, this is what I would have to type um, at my operating system terminal, which is command prompt or window on Windows, and it might be called terminal or shell or on another operating system. All right, so let me look at that. How do I use it? So, so I type uh, Python because I have my system path pointing. Uh, to Python version 3. If your system path might, if you might also have Python version 2 installed, you, you would type in Python 3 like they say up here. Alright, and so path of the input file. Um, I might be able to get away without writing that. Does it say that I can yeah, so it looks like all of these arguments are optional. So I assume that if I don't give it any path, that it is just going to look in the directory where it is. But I do want to give it the name of the input file. So that was called dash i. And then I'll start typing out hatmap. And I press tab, and it filled in the rest of the name of that file. And then what format is that input? That was a hat map, so that was number two. So dash mi is two. All right, and then what do I want it to be the output name? Um, let's call it my data.ped, and I want it to be in this ped format, so I'm going to say output mode is 3. And so that's how I give arguments to a script at the command line. So this looks a little bit different from giving arguments to a function in Python or R, but it's basically the same thing. Like each of these is an argument and then after it I'm showing the value that I want to give to that argument. So then if I hit enter it looks like it's working haven't tried this yet. It might throw an error. We'll find out. Oh, it looks like it uh, got through it without complaining. So now if I look, I have the output files that were produced by that script. And like I mentioned before, I don't really just want to blindly go ahead and use code. So let me take a look at the output. Um, Browse to it over here. So I looked up head format and it is tab delimited text, which means I can open it up in Excel, assuming it's not too big. All right, tab delimited, it's good. That might take a minute. I think this one was about 65 megabytes.
yeah, it says it can't load the whole thing, but I can at least get a preview. Okay, so then this is how it looks. Um, so I might want to look at the format in more detail and, and confirm that this is what I expect. Um, but it looks like there's actual data in here. Like if I opened it up and these were all empty or they were all ends or something like that, that might indicate a problem. Um, and a lot of these are empty, but this, this data also like didn't really have chromosome and alignment position where that was expected. But anyway, I'd, I'd want to look at this before I just sort of blindly fed this file into another program and then said, oh, well, why didn't it work? Um, it's good to check things at each step. Okay, so let's take a look at how to reuse an R script that you find online. So in this case, this is something that maybe we found in this manuscript. We have a link to um, a GitHub page with some code that was used in this paper. Now, I will say this is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine because, I mean, one day, you know, it might be five years, it might be 20 years, it might be 50 years, but probably eventually GitHub won't exist anymore. Um, and then this code will be gone, but all sorts of people are putting GitHub links in their um, manuscripts right now. Um, but you can archive your GitHub code with um, a service called Zenodo, and then they give you a DOI for it, and then it's more permanent, like if you deleted your GitHub account, or um, if GitHub went out of business or something, it would still exist. So I'm going to go to that link. All right, and here's that code. And say I want to um, generate some uh, of these ROC curves. So I want to use this rock for prock.r. And in this case, I don't have any folders. Everything is just in the main directory. So I can take a look at this script and see what it looks like. Um, so here, yeah, we have a couple function definitions. So you look like right here, there's one that they called summarize fun. Um, uh, but most of this is actually just a script that's going through step by step and doing things. So we would want to run the whole script. So we could run it from our studio. Uh, but if we take a notice here, there it starts with this command args thing. And it's, it looks like one of our important variables that gets used later um, comes from this command args. So what this actually means is that we can run this R script from the command line, kind of like the Python script that I just showed you a few minutes ago. One small problem, though, is I don't know what this command arg is supposed to be. So I can take a look and see where this nc uh, variable goes. It's still something that, especially if you're new, this might look a little confusing what this is supposed to be for. And if I go back, um, I don't really have a description here either. So it's it's not commented, it's, it's not really documented, so I've got to figure out what that argument is going to be. Now it looks from here like it's not dependent on anything else. Uh, at least anything else in this repository. So I have these um, R packages that I will need to install before I can use this. Um, but I don't see any source commands that refer to other things in the repository. So in this case, I'll just download this one. So uh, my browser will open that as a text file, but if I right click and save as, I can save it. Um, and actually, um, I don't want to save it as r.txt, I just want to save it as .r. All right. So let me open up RStudio. In fact, actually, I think my browser gives me an option to, to open that in RStudio. All right. Um, so to learn what's going to happen, maybe I want to edit that a little bit. Um, like maybe I want to put in some uh, print commands. 
Like, okay, whatever goes into NC goes into making this pattern. Actually, I'll do a command called cat that will print things out to the console. And then, you know, it's making this list of files. So maybe I also want to print out the files that it's making. Okay, and then probably I'm going to get an error somewhere because I'm going to put in the wrong thing, but this will at least um, get me started understanding what's going on in the script. So let me change into that directory. Um, actually, you know what, if you've got RStudio instead of command prompt, it's a little bit more convenient. Um, to use your terminal. So depending on your installation, your terminal here might look exactly like the command prompt, or it might look like this, like I, I have git installed, which, which causes it to look like this and behave a little bit more like a Linux. Um, either way is okay. Um, and actually, while I'm at it, before I even try that, what I've got to do is make sure I have all of those packages installed. And I can do them all in one command by making a vector with the lowercase c. All right, so now that I've done that, if I wanted to run an R script from the command line, um, the command is actually called R script. And then I'm going to type in the name of my script file. And it takes one argument here. So I'll just put in something word blah and see what that does for me. All right, so I get some warnings about um, I'm using a slightly older version of R. Da, da, da. Um, okay, so this is the output of the first cat command. Oh, that's the wrong thing. Um, right where it was printing out this thing where it, it pasted in um, my, my word there. Um, and then I went into list files. And h2 realize not found. So I think my files actually didn't get printed out because I think this command didn't produce any of them. There wasn't anything in, in my folder to match this pattern. Um, but then we have to figure out uh, this error here a little bit. So it says h2 realize not found. So let me look for this variable h2 realize. So I, I hit control F to bring up find. And then I typed in what I wanted to find. So here I see um, h2 realized equals results heritability. All right, so um, so in this case, that is the column name for a data frame. So that's OK. It looks like here, actually, the error happened in GG save. All right. Um, group equals h2 realize. So I think here normally you'd say, oh, well, this should refer to some object in my environment. But I th with the uh, ggplot and other tidyverse things, it makes it easy to turn a column header into a variable name. So it's probably grabbing it from there. Um, right, and then I think that the reason why I got the gg save error is that it did not um, uh, 
find that column probably because I didn't give it any data and it didn't have any results to get a heritability estimate. And then, you know, everything sort of went sideways from there. So probably that's fine. Um, but since uh, there's this particular pattern here for looking for files that are GWAS output from Gapit as described um, back here, where it's telling us what this does, right? Um, I might just want to not use this from the command line and edit this script to have my own file list in it. So I can see from here that the input files that I'm looking for should end in gwas.txt. But if I look at some of my own Gapit output, I don't have any .txt files. So this is something I need to investigate a little bit more. And I see that um, this repository also has something called uh, rungapit.r the script for actually running Gapit. So um, you may or may not be familiar with Gapit. It's, it's a couple R scripts that are online that are, are popular for genome-wide association studies. And so this all this header is sort of to load in everything needed for Gapit. Although this is an, an older version of how you get the um, bioconductor packages. Um, so if I see this, I see that um, Gapit was run, and then the um, output of Gapit was saved to something called foo, and then foo was used as a data frame that was saved to this uh, .txt file. Um, and then that is the input for, um, for the script that we're looking at here. So what I would probably need to do would be to rerun Gapit uh, probably by editing this script a little bit so that I made a data frame identical to this one. This is sort of like a custom output sort of thing. And then that could be the input um, for the script. Uh, because I looked at uh, Gapit and although the apparently the object output by it has this um, heritability column, uh, the files <coughs> that I have do not have that. Um, so to be sure that I'm doing it right, I would probably actually rerun this software. So I won't do that now because that would make the, the uh, video be a half hour long, but that's sort of my steps of going through this and figuring out how I would use it. And if you're like, no way, that was way too complicated, I would never figure that out, I would never feel comfortable editing the scripts. Well, you would if you had, you know, you know, just take some time to, to spend more time learning to program. But if, you know, this is, you're trying to graduate, you might not have time for that. You need to use it now. Um, what I would do is I would contact the person who made this and see if you can get a little bit of help adapting it for your data set. Um, not necessarily file an issue if you just can't figure it out versus if you found something wrong with it. I wouldn't necessarily make that be an issue, although it could be. Um, but either way, filing an issue or, or emailing the person who created it, they can probably help you. So even though this repository, we're, it would require a little bit of work and editing for us to be able to use it, um, I would still describe this as being relatively short and sweet and, and nicely written. Like it's gonna, it's gonna require some knowledge of R to modify it for your own use. Um, and it would be nice if there were you know, uh, some more comments in the code and a little bit more documentation. Um, but mostly th this is a, a repository that was published with a paper rather than published as being software for people to use. Um, this is sort of a worse example. And th this is my own code, so I'm, I'm allowed to be like super critical of it. Um, but I feel like you know when you're going through your own data analysis, this is what it kind of ends up looking like and no one wants to reuse this like i've archived this online just so my paper is is uh, reproducible and so people can reproduce all of the analysis just by by stepping through this script but if you wanted to adapt it for your own use this would be a lot more challenging because you're really going to have to dig through it 
um, see exactly what was done. You might actually have to reproduce my analysis to understand what was working. Um, and only then could you figure out um, what you needed to do. So like this is has heritability in it. Maybe I want to calculate broad sense heritability. So I found the script and I said, okay, well, how did they do it? Uh, that comes up, um, you know, on line 206, I had to do a find, uh, you know, control F find. Um, so it's like, okay, it's uh, this variance divided by the sum of these variances. Okay, well, how did I get those variances? All right, I got them uh, from a model that I made with Elmer, and this was the model. Okay, well, where did Loke Rep and Loke Sam come from? So I have to kind of work backwards because none of this is packaged into a nice, neat little function. In fact, what you might be better off doing um, is uh, looking at some of these links that I, I, I put in here for how I learned how I should even go about uh, estimating heritability. Right, so this is, um, this is the sort of script that I would say you're probably better off starting from scratch than trying to figure something like this out. On the other hand, for the same study, uh, for genetic correlation, I actually did write some functions. Um, and here there's, you know, th this is an example of something that's a little bit better. To redeem myself for a moment, so, uh, <laughs> you know, it's got an explanation of how to use them. Um, and these are functions, so you could load this file with source, kind of like we did for the CM plot file, um, right? So I could uh, copy this whole thing, actually go to raw, copy it, and then let's go back here, right? So just like that. And then if I run that, now I've got that function in my, in my global environment. Um, and there's actually a bunch of comments explaining what all of the arguments are. And so because it's a function where you have inputs and outputs, and it's, you know, it's a little bit of a long function, um, but uh, you know it's commented so you can see what each of the sections do. Um, so this this would be a lot easier to reuse because you just have to put in uh, you know source to load it. You have to understand what the arguments are, and then it's going to give you an output. 